the church of Laodicea today. And I'll read Revelation chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. Mm -hmm. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Today and yesterday, we've heard of several churches of which Jesus had some good things to say and also a rebuke. And there were two that we heard where Jesus had only good things to say of them. But here, brethren, is a church of which Jesus could find nothing good to say about them. These were in a serious state of having grown lukewarm towards God, a state which is detestable and sickening to God. Their condition was particularly dangerous because they were unaware of their condition. Yeah. They thought they were rich, increased in goods, and had need of nothing, when in reality they were poor, miserable, wretched, blind, and naked. Such a state, however, is not irreversible. For Jesus would not have held out hope to them if they could not have repented. Yes. When anyone is looking in, at themselves and to see what is in them, if they find themselves in this state, do not despair. There is repentance held out to those who are in this state. But how can you remedy a condition in which you are ignorant of, in the way that the Laodiceans were ignorant? Well, Jesus is going to tell them exactly how to be recovered out of this condition. Yes. He tells them to buy of him yes. what is needed. Yes. Recovering from any state of rebellion or separation or forgetfulness will not be free. It will cost everything, and you must go to Jesus in order to make the exchange. Only he is able to awaken those who have fallen asleep and to kindle in them a fire that will purify their hearts and make them acceptable before God. Brother Jonathan will now come and further expound this text. Amen. I can imagine what some people are thinking when this text was read somewhere out there somewhere. Why pick that church? Aren't there better ones to choose from? We have Philadelphia, we have churches where nothing bad was said about them, and yet this one was picked. Isn't this a church you just didn't have anything good to say about it all? The church of Laodicea was definitely quite a mess, to put it lightly. But the words mentioned to them are certainly intended for those who are doing well also. If nothing else, this letter shows us what the church is capable of becoming should it become like the world and start living apart from God. With that being said, these are very sobering words concerning things that even the most elite of believers must guard themselves against, lest they fall into the same state as these people here. Don't ever read the words of Jesus and think, well, that will never apply to me. Yeah. Which I'll tell you, if that is your thinking, stay put and listen. This is the right message for you, because that's what they were saying too. Yeah. I don't need anything. I'm just doing, I'm doing just fine. Everything's going well with us. Look how great things are going. That's, what they, that's their mindset when this letter was written to them. So let's not have that mindset ourselves, that we're beyond need, or that we're doing just fine. Let's be sure of our, stat our status. Now I want to be clear about what Jesus is addressing here. Jesus is addressing a church. And by church, I mean a body of people, not a building. That's what people tend to think when you say church, like I'm going to church. Well, there wasn't like a sign outside that said the Church of Laodicea. You know, he's talking about a body of people that were meeting in his name. 
of body believers that had become mixed in with the world and were in danger of being cut off because of it. You could say these were branches that were not bearing fruit. And you know what happens when a branch on the vine doesn't bear fruit? It's taken off and it's burned. So don't look at this as non-converts. Look at these as people, as they're believers who are at one time, they were on the right path and doing well, but have been drawn out of the way and in dire need of redirection and recovery from the Lord Jesus. Yes. Which brings us to this next point. In case anyone dares to think this was not a genuine church, we have spiritual affirmations that to confirm that this is the case in the book of Colossians. Here's what Paul said about this church, this congregation. So Colossians chapter 2, 1 and 2, he says, I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, yeah. this church, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts, this church, that their hearts might be comforted, be knit together in love, and unto the all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. That's what Paul said concerning this church. Great conflict for this assembly. Well, let's read another account here. Also in Colossians chapter 4, we read of Epaphras. This is in chapter 4, verse 12. He says, Epaphras, who is one of you, that is one of the brethren, one of the Colossian brethren, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea. Mm -hmm. What an advantage. The heart and the prayers of the Apostle Paul. And they have this servant of Christ, a man who's laboring fervently on their behalf. What an advantage. That's what they had. Well, read on a little more here. In verse 15, salute the brethren at Laodicea, yeah. this church. He didn't say, watch out, don't go there. Salute them. That tends that there's a fellowship there. At least at that time, there was. And then 16, he says, and when this epistle is read among you, cause it to, that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and likewise that ye read the epistle from Laodicea. So these words show that these people were on the right track. They didn't start out like this. This was a decline. A downward spiral occurred at Laodicea. But I share these things to show that if people have such advantages like these, the heart and prayers of the Apostle Paul, the one who labored more than all the other apostles. The, the, the fervent labor of a man of Christ, a servant of Christ, laboring, for, laboring earnestly for their maturity and for their understanding and for their growth and faith. And to have a, a sister church that they can, extend, ex, they can exchange scripture with. Amen. That's an advantage. They're not alone there. Amen. They're not on an island. There's a neighbor church right here that they can... They can they connect with. If they can have all of these and fall into this state, how much more those who don't have such spiritual advantages? We don't have that advantage today. We don't have the Apostle Paul here alive today, but they did. Laboring fervently for them. So this should make us all the more cautious in our own gatherings. As a warning, this is a very real danger if we become slothful. It was definitely a very troubling situation we have here at Laodicea. So I also add this, that not look at this church as the norm. Yeah, Even though in our time, this may, you may read this and think, yep, that's about right. That's about everywhere I go. Today you might read that and think that sounds normal. Well, I assure you, it's not. It does not fit with what Jesus and the apostles said the church was. Yeah. Like I said, if you have choice, have a standard, and only one person's following that standard, 99 others are not following it, you got 99 oddballs. That standard doesn't change, even if it might not be popular. Amen. Amen. When you're reading about here, you're reading about how the you're not reading about how the body of Christ normally operates. This is not normal. What you have here is an abnormality, and no believer should feel safe, safe in a state like this. Yeah. Honestly, believe a word like this is meant to make believers scared to blend with the world. They should be afraid to do this. Of very alarming words. Jesus is addressing something that's abnormal in the body of Christ. Though it is abnormal, there is a common capacity in all bodies of believers to fall into this miserable state should they not heed to the words of Christ. 
yes, this can happen to you. You even see this in, like on TV car commercials. They have that person acting out, not wearing a seatbelt and dying, and says, that could be you. Buckle up. Well, hey, Jesus has, these words are intended for us as well. Amen. Watch out. Mm, yeah. Be careful. Heed to these things. It's necessary that we heed to these words also, as well as them, and not treat it as the bad church letter. Yeah. Like when a church is doing bad, okay, they get this letter. When a church is doing good, they get this letter. All, everything Jesus says is for all the body. Yeah. Everything. So don't ignore this and say, well, I'm not doing bad. Like I said, if you are, you, this is the right letter for you. Don't treat it that way. He do everything Jesus says. There were other churches that needed correcting. This isn't the only one. We have Galatia. You're so soon removed. Embrace another gospel after hearing the true one. Now you've embraced another one. That needed correcting. And then we have the Corinthian brethren. Are you not carnal? Are there not divisions among you? Fighting against one another, not fellowshipping? Jesus, see, this shows further that Christ doesn't tolerate dysfunction and carnality in his body. He won't allow it to continue. Jesus called us out of the world. God forbid we mingle with it after being delivered from it. Now, Jesus tells his church, he says, I know your works. Mind you, Jesus never misassesses anything. Jesus is not overly critical. He's not going and ranting around about things that are really not that big of a deal. Or he's not nitpicking. And nitpicking, you sit next to someone, you come to them and get real annoyed by them real fast. Stop tapping your foot so low. Hold still. Stop reading so heavy. Stop scribbling so loud. Write bigger less. Eventually they're going to get an elbow where I'm going to move. Well, Jesus isn't going on about things that don't matter. What Jesus, if he just brings it up and says it's a problem, it's a problem. Don't treat it as a small thing that we can just ignore. Jesus isn't trying to diagnose the church or addressing just outward works or how it appears on the outside. He is addressing their actual spiritual condition. Men can cert now, men can certainly misassess things. And even themselves, nothing else, the church at Laodicea certainly shows us that. I have need of nothing. That's not the case. But this is not the case with Jesus Christ. If Jesus says you're doing well, you're doing well. It doesn't matter what anyone else says if that's declared. It matters saying, oh, you're terrible. You're not doing the work of God. Jesus says you are. Hey, that's the one you believe. Amen. If Jesus says you're doing terrible, you're doing terrible. Yeah. And all the praise of men doesn't mean squat right. if Jesus says that. Right. It just voids out what everyone else says that's contrary. Any uplifting words just wouldn't be fitting when Jesus declares such a thing. When Jesus speaks, we believe it without question. It is the truth. Just believe it. Never question the words of Christ concerning the state of his church. Also, men can't deceive Jesus. I know that, like, you experience this probably in a workplace. Sometimes that important person shows up that one time of the month or annually. That boss, you don't want to be not doing your job around him, so they give you a heads up. Hey, so-and-so is going to be here. Make sure you're doing your job. And then that person comes in. He sees everyone with a smile and doing their job well. And he might think, hey. This is how it is all the time. And he walks away thinking, boy, that's a good company. And everyone just drops their tools and just goes back to their little break when he leaves. Well, that's not the case with Jesus. You can't pull something like that on Jesus. He's always here. Jesus doesn't come and go like that. He doesn't come to check on the church, see how it's doing. He, he's here. Not only that, but isn't it interesting that his church doesn't even seem to give Jesus that courtesy. At least be doing well when he's right there in the midst of you. Yeah. Here, in the, here in the world, they have a sense to do your job when the person's around. Maybe not when he's not around, when he's here. But they didn't give Jesus this courtesy. They acted sloppy when he was right there. Much greater transgression. Sin makes you blind. But Jesus will always be able to see. Yeah. Now, it comes to the state of the church. It does matter who talks about it. Who better to speak on this matter than Jesus? Yeah. The church belongs to Jesus. He purchased it with his own blood. I think that would give him authority to speak on this, the, its condition. He's the, he's the head of the, the church of the bride of Christ. It belongs to him. He has a right to speak about his condition. He's the head of the church. He's the one running the church. If something's not working right, he knows it. And he has a right to address it and correct it, get it working again. He has that right. It's his church. The church meets in the name of Jesus. He's there in the midst of them who meet in his name. 
So if we meet for him, we should never scoff at what he says. He's the reason we're here. Now, it's unfortunate. Men have become way too conscious of what men think about them, especially in our time. There is definitely a lot of criticism about the church today. Strong and weak alike, all of them are under some kind of scrutiny, no matter how well they're doing. Church can be doing well, and someone out there is bad-mouthing it. Or if it's doing well, the wrong person's bad-mouthing it. It's terrible that a lot of these criticisms are coming from ungodly sources. People who aren't serving Christ are telling the church how it should run. This isn't right. And I know you probably hear a lot of the bantering, too. We're really like, well, this is why I don't go to church. Eh, those, ch- those Christians are nothing but hypocrites. There's ungodly people saying this. You know, like, that wasn't very Christian. <laughs> Shut up. We're not interested in what you're saying here. You're not living for the Lord. This is not your, this is not your right to do that. It's Jesus' church. Now, the church, we're not going to say the church doesn't deserve some criticism, but not from sinners. That's for sure. It deserves criticism from Jesus, though. All the people, this, this is also some, you should also refrain from doing this too if you're not living close to God. All the people that corrected the church, they were holy people. It's not like just something everyone in the pew does. And I say this in case anyone out there, whether it's in the pews, you're on live stream, or getting the impression that I'm saying that everyone who bears the name of Christ is, just goes out and criticizes everybody. I'm not saying that. If you don't have a lot of spiritual understanding, you're not living holy before the Lord, you really should not be talking about the, the status of the church. In reality, Jesus is the one who addressed these matters because it's his church. If a church is in a bad place, trust me, Jesus can restore it. Put your programs away. Jesus can restore. He may use people to do it in case of Paul. You know, he, he wrote to the Galatians and the Corinthians. But ultimately, it's Jesus doing the work here, though. He gets the credit for the restoration. In the case of Laodicea, Jesus is seeking to restore what belongs to him. Jesus isn't looking going around looking for someone to pick on. This is his church. He cares for his church. Yes. And if things are going down, Jesus is going to lift it back up. Yes. Now, the church at Laodicea was said to be neither hot nor cold, which is referring to how it's like it's blended between the two, what we call lukewarm. Think of a man holding Christ's hand in one hand and holding the world's hand in the other. That's what Jesus is dealing with, a sin of compromise. Mm. Blend in both of them. Oh, and what a spirit we see of this in our day. Compromise, compromise. Make everybody happy. Let's live where the world's comfortable with us and where Christ is comfortable with us too. It's, it's, it can't happen. But they think it can. Oh, and people get all kinds of alarmed about our times because they say, well, they're passing this law. It says we can't do this. What are we going to do? Fresh thought. Oh, revolutionary. You could just not do it. Fresh thought. That's right. If the law says you, don't have to pre- you can't preach in Jesus' name out loud, you can just do it anyway. How about that? If it says, I can't preach the word of God, I could preach it anyway. Fresh thought. Really fresh thought. This just seems to be, you don't choose the world over God, and you don't blend the world with God. It just doesn't work that way. Jesus would rather have it one way or the other. He says, I'd rather you were hot or cold. It would be better to not be a believer at all than be a believer that lives like the world. There's no, more, no sin more obnoxious to Christ than religious sin. Yes, amen. And you know why? Because it's sin with his name placed on it. Yes. Can you imagine a man separating from his family, committing adultery while holding up a Jesus saved sign? Mm. Or how about a man preaching the gospel of Christ while worshiping an idol? Mm. Don't want to get those idol worshipers upset. Or a man saying he loves the Lord Jesus and then killing a man in cold blood. Mm. It's a contradiction. Did James not address such people, calling them adulterers and adulteresses? You're friend of the world, you're the enemy of God. You can't have us both. You can't have God and mammon. It's me or him. That's the mindset. Well, people are like this in the world. You can't have me and have that. Me or him. Make a choice right now. Or I'm not going to be around you anymore. Jesus has this attitude toward the world. It's me or the world. We choose Jesus. Well, did God not say to Israel during wayward times, I hate your feasts. The sound of their praises were obnoxious to them. Stop the noise. I can't receive it because of the status that they were in. Also, Haggai wrote about how a man's good work can be rejected simply on the basis that the man who conforms that work is defiled. He's unclean, therefore everything he does is unclean. 
Jesus couldn't say anything good about this assembly because the association with the world spoiled everything it did. It produced this rotting odor. Any good works that would have been committed were of no avail due to the filth that was picked up from the world and contaminated. Something else that makes this so detestable is the fact that Jesus gave his life to put away sin. Jesus died so that men would no longer live for themselves, but they would live for God. That's the reason for the death. For men to go back to the world after Jesus suffered the most grisly, painful death in human history on their account is a total slap in his face. That's offensive. That, 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 that's the reason why God forsook Jesus on the cross, because our sin was laid on him, and for people to go back to it. Oh, after that happened, very serious thing. It's possible, well, I'm getting across, it's possible believers to fall into that state. No matter how good they may be doing at the time, they can, if they don't heed to the words of Jesus. God told his own people, he said, come out from among them and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And that is true today. Yeah. Stay separate. Don't hold hands with it. Don't join yourself to it. Separate yourself from it. Yeah. To make matters worse, the church here is completely blind to its own condition. So much so that they're deceived into thinking that they're doing just fine. They're relaxed about their state. They have need of nothing. They're rich. They have everything they need. What a thing to say when you're a disciple of Christ. I don't need anything. Christ is the one who gives us all that we have. May we never say that ourselves. However, in reality, though, <laughs> take, away the, the, take away this dream they're in. In reality, they're actually wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. The exact opposite of what they thought they were. See, sin makes you blind. You could deceive yourself into thinking you're doing great when really you're not. But Jesus doesn't deceive. Jesus, if Jesus says this is what you are, then that's what you are. Enough of what you think. This is what Jesus says. Outwardly, hey, they may have had good reason to think this outwardly. Maybe they received praise of men or something. Maybe they, maybe outwardly, it looked as though they were doing well. Maybe they were liked by everyone. Maybe they were on the right, it looked to others they were on the right track. But spiritually, this church, it was a real pile. It was lacking in all the things that it really needed. But Jesus steps in, though. He's not going to let this just keep continuing on. He's not going to let this ignorance continue on. He's going to bring that ignorance to a grinding halt. And he's going to show the church what state it's really in and what it really needs to get out of that state. But what is Jesus' reaction to this church blending with the world? He says, I would spew them out of his mouth. Now, what exactly does that mean to spew out? Well, there are some versions, they say spit. I'm going to just spit you out. And people usually do that when they have a disgusting taste in their mouth. You taste something that just doesn't taste as good, that's your reaction. Just spit it out. But some use much more stronger language. They say he's going to vomit them out. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Them being mixed with the world made him like sick to his stomach, so to speak. Oh, that's to the point where he's ready to puke them out. That sounds pretty gross, doesn't it? It's strong language, but they are the words of Christ nonetheless. Right. And we should not overlook strong words like this, not even when we're doing well. We shouldn't overlook that. Yeah, I dread the very thought of Jesus saying such a thing to me. Oh, yeah. I want to puke you out. But I ask you to join me in that determination, never to have that said of us. Yeah, Jesus never yeah. describes us that way. Amen. He wants us to present him to the Father, faithful. That's what we want. Amen. But then again, like, what does that mean? <laughs> I'm going to vomit you out. What Jesus is saying here is he's close to disconnecting from the church altogether. It's a threat of disassociation, divine separation, just cutting it. Now consider other versions of this passage, which these were the only three variances I found. Basic Bible language, it just paraphrased all together. It says, I will have no more to do with you. Strong language. Well, the message was pretty blunt. You make me want to vomit. And this one captures the meaning, I believe. It says, I am ready to vomit you out. Like I'm at that point where it's just like change now or it's going to happen. Take note. I do believe this is the intended mean that this hasn't quite taken place yet. I believe the right idea is that he's about to do it. Like I'm, yeah. I'm, like I'm, right th I'm there. I'm at that point. But at the same time, he makes the condition known intent to prevent this from taking place. Because yeah. from what I can understand, once this happens, it's gone for good. Yeah. So Jesus is given, he's fighting for his people here. Jesus doesn't just let them go without giving them some way to come back to him. 
Praise the Lord that Jesus doesn't just let go everyone who wanders. Right here you see Christ seeking the sheep that have gone astray. Those who have left, that one who left the 90 and 9, Jesus went after it and brought it back. Well, Jesus is going after these wandering sheep. Jesus won't let his people go that easily. It's not like, bye, I hope they come back. Wishful thinking? Not in, no, not in the kingdom of God. Christ goes after those who wander. He tells these brethren to come and buy certain things from him. What do you have to do to buy something? Backsliding is costly, brethren, but so is recovery. In order to obtain these following things, the Laodiceans are going to have to give up certain things, and it does not appear to be just a small cost. Pocket change, so to speak. It's a big cost. Jesus begins by telling them to buy from him gold that's tried with fire. You see, the idea here is that what Jesus has, it's genuine. It's real. It doesn't pass away. Jesus offers eternal life. That's something that doesn't end. Jesus offers treasures in heaven, which don't grow old. They don't lessen in value. Moth and rust don't destroy what Jesus gives. A thief can't break in and steal it. That's what Jesus is holding out. It's been tried. It lasts. It's real. Jesus is saying, trade in the things that pass away for something that's going to last for all of eternity. Amen. See, this is things people need to be said. They're in a backslidden state. Come and buy. Come and buy. Gold is a very high value, too. Come after me, gold dried in fire. That's, that's a valuable thing. Which shows you that what Jesus is asking us to buy, asking these people to buy, is it's not dirt cheap. It's something that's going to be costly, but it's worth sacrificing for. Next, Jesus tells them to buy white raiment that will cover up their nakedness and shame. See, the church here had become defiled, but Jesus calls it to holiness, righteousness, and purity. Jesus can cause someone who was dead in trespass and sins to be raised to walk in newness of life. Jesus could do that. God desires a person to be without blemish and without spot, and Christ can make his people those things. No blemish, no spot. Amen. Come and buy white garment, spotless garment, Amen. undefiled. So when God sees you, he doesn't see nakedness. He doesn't see shame. That's all you're standing before him, innocent. But it came with a price for these brethren. You can't live the way you want and expect to be pure in the eyes of God. Jesus says, put away defiling things so that you can be clothed in righteousness. Put away things that defile and get this in return. Righteousness, holiness, purity, something God likes to look at. Mm-hmm. Not something he'll turn his eye from. Last, Jesus tells them to buy ISAB so that they could see again. Now, what in the world is ISAB? Here is a, almost a unanimous Translation of that and all that. They almost all of them say that. I found three other ones and like I had to dig a bit to find them, but they say oil, ointment, and medicine. This is actually like a medication for diseased eyes that help restore lost vision. That's what that is. I said. But Jesus is talking about one's spiritual vision. Jesus can restore sight to the blind. He was known for this in the earth, you know. Blind men saw when they were confronted with Christ. And Jesus can restore spiritual sight also. These brethren are called to give up things that that caused them to become blind so they could see again. Have your eyes open. So in buying these things, they'll become truly rich. They'll be pure in God's eyes. And they will have spiritual sight. That sounds good, doesn't it? That sounds like a good thing to come back to. But there was a problem here. The problem is they had all of that. These are not first-time buyers we're reading about. These are people who threw the riches of God away, and they had to buy them back. People who threw off the garment, but now they got to buy it back. They had eyesight, and they went blind. they got to buy it back. Oh, brethren, going back to the world and trying to stay connected to it is costly and burdensome on so many levels. But praise the Lord, the recovery was held out and mercy was shown here. Yeah. That you can get it back. Yeah, amen. It cost you, but you can get it back. That's the point. I'd be more glory than that. I wouldn't be worried about the cost. I'd be get, hurry, get it back, whatever it takes. It can be obtained. Yeah. This may be one of the worst churches of the seven, but Jesus still showed them mercy. And that's not something to be overlooked. As we consider the nature of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, who would rather save than destroy. Amen. He didn't say it's over Laodicea. You blew it. He didn't say, I have vomited you out. You're gone. Just wanted to let you know, 
I'm done with you. That's not what he wrote here. Let's take note of that. Why did Jesus have this message delivered to the church in the first place? He certainly was warning them of judgment, but at the same time, hope is held out. Yeah. What a glorious thing to see. Jesus tells us why he rebuked this church, because he loves those that he rebukes and he chastens. Yes. Now, bad as this church may be, Jesus loves it still. He yes. loves his church. Yes. And that may not appear to be a fitting conclusion to such a message, but that's what Jesus said. I love those I rebuke and chasten. That's right. yes. So let's just believe what Jesus said. Amen. He loved them. Amen. That's why he's rebuking them. Amen. Let's not overlook that. You see, Jesus, he's aware of our enemy and his attentions. Satan would love to just snatch every one of us up and see us condemned by the God who provided salvation for us. He'd love that. And he's working zealously to bring that to pass. And all, every one of us and everyone else who believes all over the world, walking as a Roman lion seeking whom he made his vow. Yeah. Who can I take down today? I'm hungry. Mm. That's what Satan said. He's wondering, I'm hungry. He wants to eat you up. Mm. But, and even though he is fighting to destroy us, Jesus is fighting to keep us. Yeah. Remember who's more powerful too. Christ is far superior yeah. to Satan, brethren. He can take, take his people back. Mm. Remember that. He can break the jaws of the wicked and snatch the prey right out of his mouth. Jesus can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Should they get caught up in a fault, should they wander astray, Jesus can bring them back. Mm. Don't lose heart in such cases. Now, I know we don't have like a record of a church recovering in Scripture, and that's, tr that's true. But it goes both ways. You don't have one not recovering either. But there is a sense of brilliance to that if you think about it. Every time a church is in a dangerous state in Scripture and it's rebuked, sometimes quite harshly, we never really get a word about the outcome of that church. It kind of leaves it up in the air, questionable, ambiguous as to whether they really recovered or not. But it's good to know that men can recover, but then again, we don't just want to assume that we can just keep buying back. There's a sense of hope left out, and also a sense of alarm at the exact same time. You can see how the brilliance and just not really revealing that. There's hope held out, but not so much so that you're going to abuse that. You know, there's a sense of alarm, too. Like, I don't want to get into that state. It's, like I said, questionable. You don't want to be in a questionable state before God. You don't want to be scratching your head wondering, like, am I going to get in or not? Have I gone too far? You don't want that. But remember the hope, though, that was held out to these brethren. If nothing else, this should give us incentive to remember the church of our time. Consider these things in your prayers daily. You see a church not doing bad. Like, was it always like that? Was it doing great at one point? Has it declined? Well, that was the case here. Genuine, real church. Really good advantages. And it backslid. Well, if Jesus can recover this, there's many more he can recover too. Just remember, Jesus can recover. Just remember that. Not we don't want to get into the state of giving up on things. Jesus still can save those who wander. He stands at the door and he knocks and will sup with anyone who allows him to come in. And that's a troubling thing to consider. Jesus knocking and trying to let his own have his own trying to get his own church to let him in. Outside the building? They're met in his name and he's outside knocking? This this looks odd. That doesn't sound right. I'm there in the midst of them. They're my people. And I'm knocking, trying to get in. Wanting fellowship. But that's the thing. He is knocking, though. <laughs> Don't overlook that. His back's not to the door. He's not setting the church on fire. He's knocking. He's knocking. That's a good thing just to think of itself. He's still knocking. And he's ready to come in. Should anyone open the door? Ready to come in. Not to kill them. Not to wipe the place. To fellowship. To sup with them. That's what he wants to come in and do. Praise the Lord. Amen. See, Jesus doesn't give up on his people that easy. Which will make a person's condemnation all the more just if they don't let him in. Yeah. I knocked on the door. I imagine people will hear that. It's like, I was knocking. No one came. <coughs> well, we've let him in, brethren. Yeah. We want him to stay with us in our midst. It is best that we never take advantage of that invitation to sup with Jesus and that we stay with him once we get at that table. Don't leave the table. Stay with him at the table and continue to sup. Let us be all the more conscious of what Jesus thinks of us. In a time where men glory in the praise of men, we glory in the praise that we receive from Jesus. We want to know what Jesus says. We, we want to be lined up 
with this criteria we were told about earlier. Christ criteria. Do we line up with what Jesus says a good assembly is? Well, let's strive to do that. Let's be conscious that Jesus is here. What does he think? Does he like what he sees? Think about that. And be certain that what he sees pleases him. Thank you.